If you have your Bibles, if you would, turn to Matthew chapter 10. That's where we'll begin our journey this morning. Now, I'll make an apology at the outset. My voice may not last this whole lesson. But we're going to try it. <clears throat> Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33 is what we're going to be looking for. And during this lesson, can only remember this verse. Therefore, everyone who confessed me, Jesus talking, before men, I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. This morning, by way of a lesson, I would like, yeah, where's my blue marker? All right. Accountability. Accountability. According to Webster, accountability is to account for one's action responsibility, liable to give an account and to receive a reward or punishment for actions. If you look at the word, you see the root word account. And then you see right behind it, that word ability. Account is like an accounting term. Most of us has a bank account, a savings account. What do we do with it? Well, we have to reconcile it. We have to go back and match up, make sure we have the proper amount of money or whatever. Ability to account to our Creator. There are others. I'll tell you what, I'm not having any luck with markers this morning. I have to go through the stash. So we're accountable to whom? I would say the first would be accountable to the local elders. And hopefully in the near future, this congregation will have elders once again and deacons. If you go with me to Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17, it states that we are to obey our leaders and submit to them for they keep watch over our souls as those who will give an account. That is not taken lightly. For those that are elders and have been elders, the souls of the congregation lies with them as well. Also, another accountability that we have to look at is that to other individuals. Other individuals, if you would turn with me to 1 Peter, there's a couple of passages there that we'd like to look at. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. Peter writing, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that's in you with gentleness and reverence. Make a defense to everyone, other individuals. Give an account for the hope that's in us. Okay, we have to defend the word. We have to defend the word. If you turn over to the next chapter, chapter 4 of 1 Peter, verses 4 and 5, in this, they are surprised that you not run with them. And to the same ex excessive a dispensation and malign you, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. We also have an accountability to government. Eventually I will get a marker that will work. Accountability to government. Romans 13, 1 says every person is to be subjected to the governing authorities. 
for there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. And we may not like the individual within the office, but we need to respect the office because the governments are set up through God. Old Testament, we see it. I believe even today, governments are set up or established by God's providential hand for whatever reasons he may have. 1 Peter 2.13, we are to submit for ourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as one in authority. And then the last accountability Is that to God? Romans 14, 10 through 12. But you, then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will confess to God. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Barrel for verse, one that should strike us, each individual one here this morning. We are to give an account in this life to our God, the Creator, this is a personal, intimate relationship to God, the Creator. In the New Testament, when you see the word God, it's from the Greek word theos, which means God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Godhead. God is the Creator of all. We find in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God there in the Hebrew is Elohim, which has the same concept as theos in the Greek talking about all three, and all three did have a part in the creation. But being God, that is being the creator, he can tell us, the created, how he wants us to acknowledge him. He has that right. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, for my ways are not, or excuse me, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, uh, paraphrasing, saying that they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man. What they were doing, they were setting aside God, setting aside His glory, and then going out and making images of birds, a man, or whatever, and then worshiping them. What God acknowledges us, He wants is in John 4, 24. God is a spirit. We must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Remember our lesson text? Matthew 10, 32 and 33. If we confess Jesus before men, he'll do that before his Father. If we deny him, then he will deny us before the Father. But there's a fundamental question in all this. Is there a God? Research so shows that our teenagers, our young people, if I can use the millennium generation, if I am in the proper context, according to this research, are not concerned about denominations. Here's what they're concerned about according to this research. Why did God allow my parent or parents to do what they did to me? Why did God allow my parent or parents to die? Why does God allow so much pain and suffering? Where did Cain get his wife? 
How old is the earth? And there's many more questions that they pose. Our young people are interested, according to this research, in Bible basics. They want to know about the Creator and how to defend God in Genesis 1-1 and John 1, 1 through 4. They want to know and how to defend God resurrecting His Son, our King, from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 and following. Acts 2, 24. They want to know and get intimate with God through the Bible, through His written Word. They want to know how to establish Bible authority. And again, there are many more concerns that they have. They need help. They need help in a very in, in making that defense. First Peter 3.15, we've already looked at it. Because if we don't help them make the defense, guess what? When our young people start kindergarten until they graduate from high school, 12, 13 years, they have been indoctrinated by evolutionary theory, by naturalism, by saying there is no God. But what are we doing to offset that? Do we take the 11, 12, 13 years in our homes, in our Bible classes, and say, yes, there is a God? Or do we just leave it up to them saying, hopefully someday down the road when you're an adult, you'll figure it all out. In dealing with our young people and those according to this research, we are to be kind to them, but yet fair but firm. We are to show love and respect, to be kind, but yet when it comes to the Word of God, we need to stand firm upon that. There's a difference between hope and a wish. A hope, according to Mr. Thayer, is an expectation of good. Hope is real. God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, heaven, hell, things of that nature. If you would, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. And in verse 23. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he promised, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another in love and good works. A wish, according to Mr. Webster, is to have a longing for, a want. So the question is do you wish to go to heaven? Or do you hope to get to heaven? There is a difference between the two. But yet we have the scientific community I call it the scientific worldview. And I probably misspelled scientific. And what they're saying is basically this. They, this incorporates Evolution, uh, naturalism, uh, humanism, and anything else that man has designed to answer questions, is there a God? Science in its definition is a systematic knowledge derived from observation, from study, from experimentation. Carry on in order to determine the nature or principle of what's being studied. Okay, keep that in mind. Science, therefore, assumes a orderly, stable, rational universe. What does evolution give us? Evolution gives us a chaotic, unstable, irrational universe. You just go and look at their information doesn't hold to the definition of science. In the 1500s, Francis Bacon introduced his Bacon scientific method, which is basically you observe, you reproduce, you demonstrate either the falseness or the accuracy of the research or whatever you're doing. So you have this subjective look at it. That held true up to the 21st century, but then that got set aside for things like 
the social gospel, positive preaching. Let's get away from the foundation and let's make it where people can feel good when they come to worship and things of that nature, contend to their needs. But yet we have another worldview over here. I call that the creation worldview. And what they what we have, if you're in the creation worldview, you have the word of God. Okay. Scientific worldview, their information changes quite a bit through the course of the year. The God word never changes. Creation, though, is outside the strict sense of the scientific definition. You can't observe it. You can probably study it a little bit, but you can't experiment on it. So the questions are like, can you observe or reproduce anything in Genesis 1? Well, the answer is no. You can't create. Can you experiment on creating life? Well, the scientific worldview has put a lot of money into a thermal lab, which is a big laboratory up in Chicago. It's uh, dealing with uh, particles and, and stuff. And what they're trying to attempt to do is answer questions like, what are we made of? What are we made of? How did the universe begin? And they want to get down to the minute element of any of the elements and, and see how it was created. In other words, they're attempting to create life. Their vision statement is this. Our vision is to solve the mysteries of matter, energy, space, and time for benefit of all. As I say, they're trying to explain the origin of life. In order to create life, you have to have all of it. Time, force, energy, space, and matter. Creation worldview. Has it in one verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning is our time. God is the force. Created is the energy. The heavens is the space. And earth is the matter, therefore it has accomplished everything that the definition of science is given by Mr. Webster and had done it a whole lot sooner than what he's written down. So the question is, on based on this, which one requires more faith to believe in? Scientific worldview or the creation worldview? If anyone wants to know the mysteries of the matter, energy, force, space, time, then God's Word is where we need to be at. The Bereans, in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, states, Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the Word with great eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see whether these things are so. That's what we need to be doing, like the Bereans of old. The Big Bang Theory, and that's not the TV show that the scientific worldview has, is just one evolution tentacle that they have. And they have many. The Big Bang Theory is very simple. God spoke, and bang, it happened. Okay, it didn't take millions of years or billions of years. He spoke it, it happened. D. Bowman, D. Bowman is quoted as saying, if they had a big bang, then they have to have a big bang, a big banger. Somebody that's gonna do it. We do. The universe is eternal. Prophet Daniel in Daniel 12, 3 says that stars forever and ever. The musical or the film back in 1965 called The Sound of Music had a song in it named Something Good. And in that song, they have a lyric, if I understand it right. And that lyric is, nothing comes from nothing, nothing ever could. So even back then, they understood nothing came from nothing. 
But in 1982, an interview with an agnostic scientist from NASA called Robert Sturwall, S, or excuse me, <clears throat> J-A-S-T-R-O-W. And in that interview, the title of it was A Scientist Caught Between Two Face. Is this, this not two face? You got to fall in one or the other. Can't be in the middle. Okay. And in that interview, he states in Christianity Today, this, this quote, Astronomers now find they have painted themselves into a corner because they have proven by their own methods that the world began abruptly in an act of creation to which you can trace the seeds of every star, every planet, every living thing in the cosmos and on the earth. Bear with me. And they have found that all this happened as a product of forces they cannot hope to discover. That there are what he and everyone would call supernatural forces at work is now, he believes, a scientific proven fact. Scientists in this worldview have backed themselves into a corner by their own methods, and by doing that, a product of forces they cannot discover. A product of forces they cannot discover, yet we know that God created universe. Here goes my rapid fire verses. I will try to go slow. God's word is powerful if you go to Romans 1 16. The power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. 1 Corinthians 1 18 says, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. We already looked at Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created. There's his power. In the book of Psalms, there's three that I like to point out. Psalms 8.3. When I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers. There's the power. Psalms 33.8. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. In Psalms 102.25, Of old ye founded the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. We can go in the book of Acts 17.24-26 through 26 and paraphrase it, And God made the world and all things in it. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth. That's power. God's word is powerful. We already looked at John 1, 1 through 4, and in verse 14, in the beginning, the word was with God, the word was God. Verse 14 drops down, and the word became flesh and dwelt among them. Isaiah talked about in Isaiah 42, 12, let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praises in the coastlines. Jesus talking about the marriage relationship in Matthew 19 and in verse 4. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Paul writes in Colossians 1.16, For by him all things were created. God's word is powerful. In the book of Revelation, uh, what most scholars will donate or will designate as the praise sections of those of that book. And when you get those, remember about the tel color telescope. Remember the awesome pictures that it has brought to us. But remember, there was a creator, an intelligent designer, a creator, our God, that did just that, the beauty of it. The scriptures themselves assume that God, there is a God. If you go to Exodus 7, chapter 7 through 11, there was a God behind those 10 plagues. Yes, he used Moses as his instrument, 
but God was behind them. Jeremiah 10, 12 through 13. It is He who made the earth by His power. He established the world by His wisdom. And by His understanding, He stretched out the heavens. When He uttered His voice, there was tumults of water in the heavens. And He caused the clouds to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain and brings out the wind from his storehouses. Remember how powerful God is next time we have a good thunderstorm coming through. That's him. Romans 1 and verse 20, paraphrasing states, states that since the creation, God's divine nature has been clearly seen and understood. We just have to look for it, and we don't have to go very far to do that. You look in the heavens, you look out in nature. You can look at your own body and see the magnificent, intelligent designers behind it, designer behind it. Colossians 1, 15 through 17, God was before all creation. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was before Genesis 1.1. That's how powerful he was. He has no beginning, he has no end. If we deny the historical accuracy of the Old Testament, if we are to if we deny that, then we make Jesus as a false teacher. Think about it. If we deny the historical accuracy of the Old Testament, then we make Jesus as a false teacher. Jesus quoted Scripture, quoted the Scripture of Old Testament that he had. When he was tempted in Matthew chapter 4, what did he do with Satan? He went back to the Old Testament and brought passages out. If that historical accuracy of the Old Testament is not there, if it's denied, if we deny it, if we just made Jesus a false teacher. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, we find that he said the Old Testament says this, but I say this. If you look on a woman to lust, as I say, if you already looked and in your heart, he goes back to the Old Testament. We find in the marriage laws in Matthew chapter 19, we've already looked at one. He went back to the Old Testament. Remember our lesson text, Matthew 10, 32 through 33? We pass him before men, he'll confess us before his father. If we deny him before men, we'll die before father. How do we do that? Very simply, somebody asks a question, and A, you don't respond to it, or B, you respond to it and it's false, then you have just denied Jesus Christ. Therefore, he has the right to deny you before his Father. Jesus confirms Old Testament events. In Matthew 24, 36 through 37 through 38, he confirms there was a Noah. We find in John 8 and in verse 58, he confirms there was an Abraham. And in Luke 16, 16, he confirms there was prophets of the Old Testament. One more point for lesson jurors. You've been very patient. There's a difference between make and created. Created. God or made man in his image. Man was created in God's image. He gave us a soul. He gave us a spirit. Remember John 4, 24? God is a spirit. He created a special relationship with us. Us being mankind, if we will follow Him. That relationship is that we can talk to Him directly. Anywhere, anytime, any part of the day, night. He loves to hear from us. He wants us to worship Him the way He wants to be worshipped. 
On the other hand, made, God made us with a free will or choices. He didn't say, I want to create you and therefore I want to tell you you need to come and all. He is letting us to decide where our fate lies. He, he made the plan of salvation because he knew before beginning the time that sin was on the end of the world. And that plan of salvation is very simple. You hear the word, Romans 10, 17. You believe in that word, Mark 16, 15 through 16. You repent, you change your life, you go from one direction to the other direction. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Also Acts 22, 6. You are to confess that Jesus is the Lord. Acts 8, 37. You are to be baptized into Him. 1 Peter 3.21, Galatians 3.27. And it doesn't end there. A lot of people think, yeah, once I'm baptized, that's it. It ends. No. As Revelation 2.10 says, live faithful unto death. Are we going to have struggles? Yes. Are we going to have disappointments? Yes. Are we going to possibly fall away? Yes. It's possible. But guess what? He less left an avenue for us as well that has gone away, straight away from the faith. 2 Peter 2.20-21, 20 Hebrews 6.4-6. through 6. And then we find early on in Acts chapter 8.22 that Simon wanted to buy from the apostles that power, but yet the apostles told him he needed to go and pray to God. And they so did. So if you're falling away, if you made... If you deny Jesus and you're so assembled, you have an invitation to come back to Him. If you're not a Christian, if you know that you heard the word, that you believe and repent best, and you know that, and we've had two of our young folks to do that recently, probably more in the audience. I would say that you take seriously every invitation and make things right in your life before you make that commitment. I was young when I was baptized, and I know the struggles that is facing the young people as they go through, and it is difficult. You stumble, you fall. I always remember the poem, Footsteps in the Sand. You look back and there was two sets of prints. You look back again, there was just one set of prints. Look back a third time, you see two sets and the person asked God, Jesus. When I look back, I see two prints of steps, then one print, then two. It's like, what happened to the one print of steps? He told me he was going to be with me always. And Jesus' response is, I was, I was carrying you. I look back, it was those times I had difficulty in the world, and guess what? Jesus was carrying me because I wasn't response to Him. I did not give focus to heavenly things. I was saying, I was first, I can figure this out, instead of, Lord, here's my situation like Hezekiah did, laid it out, tell me what to do. The invitation is yours if you so desire it as we come and stand and sing. Why can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Why can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the love that makes me white as snow. No other God I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus.
For my pardon and this I sing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the blood that makes me white as snow. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can pour sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not a good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the blood. That makes me white and so old. No other found I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And thank Mark for the lesson this morning. Appreciate those comments. It's always interesting when you go back and look at what evolutionists claim or uh, presume happen and compare that to the word, um, you would obviously have to say that it would take more faith to believe that than it would to believe that there is a God. And uh, thanks, uh, thank you, Mark, for bringing that back to our remembrance. Again, we'll be meeting this afternoon at four, and we hope to see everyone here. And uh, we have nothing else. We'll be dismissed after one item. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, so Matt left, uh, not feeling well, so let's remember him in our prayers. This time we'll be dismissed after word prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day you've given us. Thank you for allowing us all to come together here to study another portion of your word. Lord, we pray for the sick, help them to get better and return to us at the next appointed time. We also pray for those that are out traveling, um, help them stay safe and return to us at the next appointed time. Lord, we pray that you look over us throughout this next week, help to um, help us to be good Christians and to be a shining light in, the, in this community. Lord, we... Uh, Thank you for all your many blessings and for your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.